Okay, in our video series of pulmonology lectures, in this video, we are going to talk about cough. We are going to discuss what are the different types of cough, what are the causes of cough, and how do you treat cough according to the cause. First of all, cough is a protective mechanism that forcefully expels the air out from lungs to clear the secretions, foreign bodies, and irritants from the airway. The speed of cough is 50 to 80 kilometers per hour. That's a very interesting fact. So, it is actually a protective mechanism. But in some cases, this protective mechanism does not play a role of protection for the airway. Now, acute cough is the one that lasts less than 3 weeks. Chronic cough is the one that lasts greater than 8 weeks, that lasts greater than 2 months. And subacute cough is the cough that lasts between 3 to 8 weeks. What causes acute cough? The most common cause of acute cough that comes and goes away, as many of you might have experienced, are the infections. Common cold, acute bronchitis, inflammation of the bronchi. COVID-19 infection is the most common cause in the very recent years where there has been infection of COVID-19 and acute cough has been the main hallmark symptom of COVID-19. Exacerbation of asthma, COPD, bronchiectasis is a common cause of acute cough. These patients of asthma, COPD, they get a respiratory infection, a viral infection like respiratory syncytial virus, most common virus that cause exacerbations in the COPD patients and they would develop this acute cough. Other than that, these patients of COPD, bronchiectasis, they have a chronic disease all the time. They might have a lingering cough that is present all the time. So, these patients of COPD, bronchiectasis, asthma, they fall into the all three categories of acute cough, subacute cough, and chronic cough. Reactive airway syndrome. Reactive airway syndrome is that there is a, a infection or there is a irritation of the airway that results in the bronchospasm of the airway. But it is different from asthma that it, it occurs for a few weeks and then it goes away and patient has no symptoms later on. So, it is, it is just like asthma, but it is for a shorter period of time. That is called as reactive airway syndrome due to hypersensitivity of the airway to the irritants. Coming to the causes of subacute cough, the most common cause of subacute cough is post-infectious cough. It is the most common cause. Most of the time, these patients with acute cough, when they develop these acute infections, after they are done with the infection, there is a lingering cough that is present for weeks. After three weeks, they are still having the cough. There is no productive sputum. There is still this dry cough that is present that linger on even after the infection. That is called as a post-infectious cough. And that post-infectious cough occurs because of the hypersensitivity of the airway to any irritants. Just because there has been damage due to an infection, acute infection damaged the airway. Now that airway is a bit hypersensitive. The receptors are a bit hypersensitive the irritants and there is a lingering cough after the infection and these but this goes away by itself and it does not require any treatment acute cough might require treatment but subacute cough that is post infectious cough do not require any treatment because the sputum is not productive the uh, the cough is not productive and the patient is not having any active infection is just the hypersensitivity of the airway border telepertesis causes whooping cough and that whooping cough might be there for a longer period of time, it might be there for weeks to months. Exacerbation of asthma and COPD fall into all three categories. Now coming to the causes of chronic cough. In the causes of chronic cough, it's very interesting. Asthma is the leading cause of chronic cough. Many times patients would come to you and they would complain that doctor, I have this chronic cough all the time. This is a dry cough and it is worse at night. When you examine the patient, there is no wheezing in the chest. There is no dyspnea, there is no shortness of breath as a typical asthma patient will have. Because this is actually a cough variant of asthma. Where there, there may, might not be an actual wheezing or dyspnea or shortness of breath, it's just the cough that is present. And cough variant asthma is the most common cause of dry cough after ruling out other pathologies. So these patients are experiencing cough variant asthma and it can eventually progress to dyspnea and wheezing in the later stages. But in the initial stages when they come to you, they will not be having the classical symptoms of asthma. It is just the dry cough that does not leave them. They have tried many remedies, but it is not improving. So that dry cough, that cough variant asthma, we do not have any specific test to diagnose that cough variant asthma. It is confirmed by giving empiric therapy to the patient. 
you give in, inhaled glucocorticoids to the patient and if the patient responds to the inhalers, it confirms that that patient was having cuff variant asthma. So, cuff variant asthma is the leading cause of chronic dry cough in patients, cough lasting more than 8 weeks. Second and the third most common cause of chronic cough lasting more than 8 weeks is GERD. Gastroesophageal reflux disease is the second and the third most common cause of chronic cough in the patients. Patient might not give you a classical history that he is having this epigastric pain or he is having this uh, uh, symptoms of GERD. The only symptom of GERD you might get is the cough. So many times it also happens that the patient of GERD are suffering from GERD and they do not have those typical symptoms of GERD. The only symptom is the cough that worsens after taking food, that worsens on lying down at night. So GERD is the most important cause uh, in chronic cough after asthma. And in, in this, it is also the empiric therapy that confirms the diagnosis. You give empiric PPIs, you uh, apply certain lifestyle modifications that we'll talk about in a while. And if the patient improves, it confirms that that patient was having GERD. Other than that, it is associated with dysphonia because of the acid going into the airway. There is dysphonia, nasal symptoms, non-productive throat clearing. These patients might always be trying to clear their throat and they will not be having any sputum. That will be a dry cough. And sometimes patient can also have heartburn or sore throat in the mouth. If the patient has a classical typical history of GERD and with that patient is complaining of chronic cough, it's very likely that that patient is having cough due to GERD. But it is important for you to know that sometimes the patient might not even have the symptoms of GERD and still have cough secondary to GERD. Diagnosis is clinical and response to empiric therapy. Other than that, non asthmatic eosinophilic bronchitis is also a cause of chronic cough. Basically, patient is not having asthma, but there is inflammation of the bronchi and bronchioles, and that is an eosinophilic inflammation, and that causes chronic cough. COPD patients can also have a chronic cough that is there for a long period of time. Upper airway cough syndrome. Now, this is important. Many times it happens that patients are having upper airway cough syndrome. There is some problem like post nasal drip and that patient is having chronic cough. Now, these are also the patient that will be clearing throat all the time. The patient will be having post nasal drip. When you take the history that are you experiencing any post nasal drip, anything falling down your throat, they will say yes, we are experiencing post nasal drip. So, the cause of chronic cough is the post nasal drip in these patients. That is called as upper airway cough syndrome. These patients are always found clearing their throat. Other than that, drugs like ACE inhibitors cause cough. ACE inhibitors increase bradykinin because bradykinin degradation occurs by ACE and ACE inhibitor block the ACE enzyme. Therefore, bradykinin levels increase in blood and they cause cough. Calcium channel blocker bisphosphonates, calcium channel blocker and bisphosphonate, latinoprost, they basically increase the chances of GERD. They relax the lower esophageal sphincter and they increase the chances of GERD and that cuff due to CCB and bisphosphonates is secondary to GERD. Other than that, pulmonary diseases like bronchiectasis, lung cancer, interstitial lung disease can cause chronic cough. There is a long list of causes that cause chronic cough, but I have jotted down some really important causes that you should know about. Now, if a patient comes to you with cuff greater than or equal to 3 weeks, you take the history and examination. If there is post nasal drip, if there is asthma, if there is GERD, there is no specific test that you can go for. You have to treat the patient empirically. If the patient responds to the therapy, it most likely confirms the diagnosis. If there is purulent sputum, if the patient is smoker or if there is ACE use or if the patient is immunocompromised, immunocompromised patient raises the risk of infections like tuberculosis. If the patient is having any one of these things, then you have to treat accordingly. For purulent cough, you have to treat, uh, you have to perform the chest x-ray and give antibiotics. In the smokers, many times it is the smoke that is irritating the airway and it is causing chronic dry cough. You, are, you tell them to stop smoking and you help them with stopping smoking. If the patient is on ACE inhibitors, then you stop the ACE because ACE can induce a cough. You can shift the patient to angiotensin receptor blocker ARBs like Valsartan. If the patient is immunocompromised, you have to screen the patient for tuberculosis. The next thing that you have to do in these patients is you have to look for the danger signs. You have to look for fever, night sweats, weight loss. If there are fever, night sweats, weight loss, it's indicate toward tuberculosis. It, it might even indicate toward a lung abscess. Purulent sputum, hemoptysis might indicate lung cancer, an abscess in the lung. Dyspnea, shortness of breath with cough might indicate 
that patient might be having pulmonary artery hypertension patient might be having heart failure patient might be having any pathology that is causing the dyspnea immunosuppression is a risk factor for tuberculosis so these are the danger signs that you must look in a patient that presents to you with cough lasting greater than 3 weeks now remember cough is a very broad topic i have tried to list down some really important causes that you should look for some really important signs that you should look for some really important questions that you should ask from the patient in the treatment if you think that the patient is having asthma the cough variant asthma where there is no wheezing you can give a trial of inhaled glucocorticoids low dose or medium dose inhaled glucocorticoids are given if the patient does not respond to this you can increase the dose of inhaled glucocorticoids or leukotriene receptor antagonists now the inhaled glucocorticoids that you can use in these patients are beclomethasone beclomethasone low dose medium dose high dose it is administered in two divided doses and uh, per day according to the low dose you can give two or four inhalation and accordingly the uh, doses are written and the inhalations are written in the chart you can give budesonide budesonide is available in an inhaler called as plumicort and the doses are also given here over here you can give fluticasone fluticasone propionate and the doses are also mentioned over here you can give momitasone these are all the drugs that can be used for the treatment of asthma so these are inhaled corticosteroids that you can use in these patients and the, if the if the patient responds to the therapy it likely confirms the diagnosis if you suspect that the patient is having gerd gastroesophageal reflux disease then lifestyle modification is very important and the lifestyle modification you ask the patient to lose weight you ask the patient to elevate the head of the bed place 6 to inch 8 uh, inch blocks under the legs of the head of the bed you ask the patient to stop smoking avoid meals before the bedtime avoid fatty food that induce acid secretion chocolates caffeinated beverages carbonated beverages red wine orange juice because these are the foods that stimulate acid secretion so these are the lifestyle modifications you tell the patient to have when the patient is having gerd with that you can uh, you have to give a trial of acid suppression in the trial of acid suppression ppis are stronger than uh, h2 antagonists and ppis like omeprazole 40 mg once daily are given in the morning on empty stomach before the breakfast then the patient at least has to take these ppis for 8 weeks because it takes them almost 8 weeks to work so patient might not be having a typical symptoms of gerd and the patient the patient cough responds to the treatment it means that it was likely gerd that was causing the cough persistent cough after a upper respiratory tract infection it is due to increase cough receptor sensitivity after the infection increase bronchial reactivity to the uh, uh, irritants after an infection so patient is not having any current infection but this this cough goes away by itself but if the patient wants any treatment you can go for first generation antihistamine like brompheniramine chlorpheniramine clemestine doxylamine these are first generation antihistamine and they have a more sedating effect but the anticholinergic effect as compared to second generation anti antihistamines like fexofenadine they have a more stronger anticholinergic effect and are more Uh, important in uh, suppressing the cough so you have to tell the patient that you have to take it at night if the patient is having nocturnal symptoms even if it, if the cough is disturbing the sleep they will have to take uh, it at night it helps this with this the sleep as well as it stops the cough in the upper airway cough syndrome like in patients with post nasal drip in post nasal drip patient first generation antihistamines can be used like brompheniramine chlorpheniramine clemestine doxylamine and the same thing they are more sedating but stronger anticholinergic effect other than that in these post nasal uh, drip patients albuterol or inhaled uh, ipratropium the bronchodilators may also be very useful in these patients so the treatment of chronic cough chronic dry cough where you do not have any infection going on it mainly revolves around the treatment of asthma the inhaled steroids inhaled bronchodilators and antihistamines and ppis so these are the drugs that are commonly uh, used for the treatment of chronic cough unexplained chronic cough the chronic idiopathic cough where you do not know where it is coming from you have done all the work up and you are unable to find uh, the cause it is also called as cough hypersensitivity syndrome it usually responds very well to inhaled glucocorticoids so 
if you if you are unable to find out the cause but still the patient is cough so it always comes down to asthma being the most common cause the cough variant asthma inhaled glucocorticoids or inhaled ipratropium can be used in these patients inhaled ipratropium blocks the efferent uh, uh, limb of the cough reflex and ipratropium also decreases the stimulation of the cough receptors two inhalations by meter dose inhaler four times daily is used other than that there are certain drugs like gabapentin pregabalin they reduce the cough by central suppression gabapentin is initiated at a low dose 300 mg once daily with a maximum dose of 1800 mg per day in two divided doses pregabalin is initiated with low dose and gradually increased over a week to 300 mg per day to minimize the sedation opiates many of the times you would see that many of the cough syrups contain opiates they suppress via a central cough center and these are usually given in patients that have lung cancer and they have very debilitating cough that is disturbing their life so you give morphine codeine to these patients morphine the starting dose is 5 mg slow release twice daily if there is no response the dose can be doubled up codeine initial dose is 30 mg every 4 to 6 hours and can be increased up to 60 mg the const the main side effects of opiates are the constipation and somnolence other cough suppressants that are very commonly found in the uh, over the counter available cough syrups include dextromethorphan benzonatate gofofenzin so what are the mechanisms of these now we'll discuss that dextromethorphan is actually a known opiate uh, drug that decreases the sensitivity of the cough receptor and works very effectively extended release 60 mg orally twice daily is given benzonatate is peripherally acting and it anesthetizes the stretch receptors in the lungs and the pleura so it is peripherally acting it does not act in the cns and the dose is 100 to 200 mg orally three times daily gofenesin is the a drug that is mostly in syrup and it decreases the viscosity of the airway mucus it breaks the mucus and uh, is an expectorant as well it inhibits the cough reflex sensitivity dose of extended release gofenesin is 600 mg to 1200 mg every 12 hours now coming to the complications of cough now as i said mostly the cough is acute due to infections you have to treat the infections and the cough goes away by itself the sub acute cough is usually the post infectious cough that linger on for some time does not need really need much treatment but the chronic cough in patients is really debilitating and uh, sometimes it might not have a protective effect and might be more damaging in the complications of cough include exhaustion insomnia it might disturb the it might disturb the sleep headache hoarseness of voice perspiration urinary incontinence fear of a serious disease very common thing many times these patients would come to you they would be young patients and uh, would be having this chronic cough chronic dry cough maybe due to post nasal drip maybe you know uh, maybe due to gerd uh, and they will have they will be worried that they might be having lung cancer ribs fracture syncope so these are some common complications of cough if you liked my video please click on the subscribe button and check out my other videos on asthma COPD and pulmonology lectures the link of those videos is given in the description below in this video we talked about what is cough what is how do you classify acute subacute and chronic the most common cause of acute cough is infections chronic cough most common cause post infectious cough asthma being the leading cause of the chronic cough uh, gerd is the second and third most common and other important causes how do you do the work up look out for the danger signs of cough asthma responds to inhaled glucocorticoids the different inhaled glucocorticoids that can be used lifestyle modifications are prescribed in gerd and with lifestyle modification excess suppression with a ppi is also done persistent cough after respiratory infection responds to antihistamine antihistamine is also used in post nasal drip related cough unexplained cough due to any reason usually responds well to glucocorticoids gabapentin pregabalin are central suppressants opiates in patients with lung cancer and morphine codeine can be used other than that dextromethorphan known opiate that decreases the sensitivity of cough receptor benzonatate uh, anesthetizes the stretch receptors in the pleura and lungs gofenesin decreases the uh, viscosity is an expectorant and inhibits the cough reflex and the complications of cough if you liked my video please click on the subscribe button and make sure to check out my lectures on ecg my lectures on emergency medicine and pulmonology lectures You can also follow me on Instagram for the different reels.
for more videos please click on the subscribe button thank you very much